Today we're talking with Dr. Gene Boomer. Welcome to the program. Good afternoon. Gene, tell us a little bit about yourself and what your current role and responsibilities are. Okay. I'm uh, currently manager of field technical services with Arm & Hammer Animal Nutrition. I previously had a veterinarian and nutrition practice out of Kansas. The last 15 years have worked across the southern part of the United States, from kind of Florida to California, specializing on nutrition and dairy herd management. With a special interest, I guess, in transition cows and young calves. Today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the things you've learned over those years of experience working with transition cows, and you've got five keys to share with us today. What are those five keys? Well, we're going to start with a pre-fresh cow and, and minimizing that stress pre-partum, and then move on to maintaining dry matter pre-partum, then maximizing that dry matter intake the first few days following calving, and then talk a little bit on maximizing comfort, and then how to monitor these programs, the health and performance of your herd. Let's start at prepartum then. Minimizing stress at prepartum. How do you suggest a dairy producer do that? Okay. Uh, as far as minimizing stress prepartum, I recommend that we avoid all unnecessary pen moves from the far off to the close up pen as much as possible, especially during the last 10 days prepartum. So I recommend that we move our cows once a week and in groups of 10 or more. I also highly recommend that we separate heifers and multiple lactation cows, keep those heifers separate. They'll eat more and perform better. And then the overcrowding is definitely a concern. Keeping that stocking density to less than 100% was really a goal of 85% based on your feed bunk space. We just can't force too many of those cows up to the bunk at one time. The next area is focusing on quality feed sources. You know, example of things that we really can't tolerate in a close-up ration are silages with high butyric acid and moldy feeds. I also recommend that dairy feed their close-up cows twice a day versus a traditional once a day, especially in the warm climate. This ensures feed quality and availability. And then just moving on to the area of keeping the dry matter intake up prepartum, I recommend that dairymen select feeds that are low in potassium to minimize the need for anionic salt. And we try to formulate these rations with approximately 17 to 19 megacals of metabolizable energy. We certainly don't want to overfeed dry cows, especially the far-offs and the close-ups. We are very aware that mud and heat stress can increase that maintenance requirement by 30 to 50 percent. We definitely do not want to overfeed energy in the close-up pen. And then I recommend formulating rations with approximately 1,100 to 1,200 grams of metabolizable protein. These close-up heifers and cows have a need for metabolizable protein because of the fast-developing fetus, the mammary gland, and the immune system right at the end of gestation. Also, we recommend formulating these rations with a decad of a negative 8 to 12 to minimize the incidence of metabolic disorders hypocalcemia or clinical hypocalcemia, dairymen know as milk fever is a common one, but the subclinical or low blood calcium without the signs of milk fever are linked to the fresh cow disorders like metritis, mastitis, and impaired immunity. So we all learned that calcium is a messenger boy to the smooth muscle we also now know that it's a messenger boy to the white blood cells that fight infection. So calcium is very important to both the immune system and the musculoskeletal system. If you're monitoring your urine pHs, we recommend that you keep them between 6.0 and 6.8. If you're having trouble getting them that low, you want to check the occlusion rates of your anionic salts or your chloride package. And if there's a lot of variation, check for overcrowding or sorting of the ration because the cows aren't all getting the same amount of supplement. And then remember that not all sources of anions have the same palatability or are the equal sources of metabolizable protein. So after calving, what do you recommend to continue on into a successful transition? 
Yes, continuing on with the transition after calving, we recommend maximizing dry matter intake or getting the cow to eat as much as possible as early as possible. Part of that comes from moving the cows directly to a high cow ration or a fresh cow ration that we feed for approximately 14 days. But one of the concerns is if we use this fresh diet, we usually put a little more fiber in those diets, but we don't want to compromise very much on energy density in that fresh diet. If we do, we'll mobilize fat and muscle, and we'll have extra amounts of weight loss in those fresh cows. And we definitely don't want to have big swings in weight the first 30 days in lactation. We'd also recommend that you increase the potassium in these diets to drive dry matter intake and to get the DCAD up to 38 to 45. This helps with dry matter intake and it buffers the cow system at the cellular level where she is doing the most work, or in the udder, the liver, and the kidneys. And all these working cells produce heat, CO2, water, and hydrogen ions, which equal acid. And so we have to buffer this and the sodium and the potassium in the diet definitely help do, do this. Also, we want to deliver a palatable, consistent ration every day. So we need to monitor particle size, moisture content, and manure to evaluate ration quality. Then as we move on to maximizing the cow comfort of these animals, we want to provide these transition cows with clean, dry, and comfortable beds or corrals. Cows desire the softer surfaces for lying or standing, and they prefer less restrictive stalls. So we want to keep our stalls open, clean, and comfortable. We know that mud and heat stress in these fresh cow pens increase the incidence of metabolic disease, and we want to minimize the distance that these animals have to travel to the parlor to be milked. So put the pens close to the parlor, and minimize the amount of time that they're away from their feed bunks and their places to lie. Minimize the lockup times. Keep it to 30, 45 minutes a day. We found that the higher stocking densities just increase the aggressive competition at the bunk and you have more injured cows and more feet and leg problems. It's also been shown that lying time takes precedent over feeding time. Cows are motivated to lay down 12 to 13 hours per day, and if this requirement isn't met, health and production are impaired. Research has shown us that cows with restricted lying time have greater serum cortisol and lower growth hormone, which are both are not good things for these fresh cows. We have estimated that a cow sacrificed one minute of eating time for each three and a half minutes of lost rest when it's less than 12 hours. So as they have to stand on their feet more and don't get to lie down as much, they end up spending less time at the feed bunk each day. And then the final area is to monitor the health and performance of your herd. We can't manage these transition cows if we can't measure some key parameters. So the first one is to observe the cows. Are they bright and aggressive eaters or are they lethargic and glassy-eyed and don't move around good in the corral up and down from the bunk? So some of our dry matter goals, and I know these change from herd to herd, but prepartum we want these cows to eat greater than 28 pounds of dry matter for multi-lactation cows and greater than 24 for the first lactation animals. And then postpartum, greater than 38 pounds if they're less than three weeks in that fresh cow pen. And it depends on the population of the pen, what the average day's milk is in that pen. We want at least 38 pounds of dry matter there. And then implement a good fresh cow program the first 10 days where you monitor these cows on a daily basis. Work with your herd veterinarian to develop that program. And then record some production data and fresh cow events such as week four milk, your DAs, your retained placentas, mastitis, and metritis. And then observe the body condition score. And we do not want weight swings of greater than 100 pounds during this first 30 days in milk. So look at both the records and your cows. Most importantly, watch your cows. As far as a summary of the points we've covered today, I'd have to say that there is no one-size-fits-all transition cow feeding strategy. 
because of the interaction of the nutrition, the environment, and the management. It's unique in every dairy that we go to. I'd also stress that we reduce the stress on all fronts from a nutrition standpoint, an environmental impact, and a management standpoint. And then monitor your cows and your records. And remember, action is the key. Make strategic adjustments to nutrition, environment, and management. Thanks, Dr. Boomer, for sharing these five keys to a successful transition. Thank you for the opportunity to share some ideas with the dairy industry today. The information we've shared today goes really well with the Transition Cow article that we published in April of 2010, and uh, the resource to find that article is in the resource links for this program.